we begin our meditation on God's Word in the name of Jesus, dear Christian friends. Well, there's the story of a pastor by the name of D.L. Moody from back in the 1800s, and he had went to visit a man who had fallen out of regular worship at his church. And when he arrived at the man's house, uh, the fellow welcomed the pastor warmly. He pulled up two chairs near the, the fireside, and they began to talk. After some small talk, the, the man decided to explain, uh, with, with all due respect, why he didn't really need time in God's house every Sunday. He didn't need to be around church people in order to have a strong faith. And as he gave his reasons and he laid out his argument, the pastor was careful not to just jump on the guy and get defensive. He didn't just launch with a, a series of passages proving why the man was wrong, although he certainly could have. But instead, the pastor stayed completely silent. And as the man was talking, he simply reached over with some tongs to the fire and he took a single glowing ember out and sat it down on the cold stone hearth below. Well, as the young man kept on trying to make his case, he, he couldn't help but notice that out of the corner of his eye, he saw that, that glowing red-orange ember slowly to begin to lose its glow and die out. And the pastor just looked him in the eye with a knowing and caring look, which the man sputtering just simply said, okay, pastor, I get your point. Well, it's just like that in the summertime too, isn't it? You can be grilling out, and I don't care if you have the, the Kingsford edge, you know, or if you buy match light charcoal with the lighter fluid built right in it, you know, or, or value brand. If you don't keep your coals in a nice tight pile, they won't stay glowing red and hot. It's the same thing too with geese flying south for the winter. We've seen some of them going over in formation. When they stick together, well, things go well and everybody gets to their destination. You know, that you can't help but wonder with a caring glance up at that one lone goose that's become separated from the rest of them and you can't help but wonder if he'll make it. As fish swim in schools, Ants and bees work together. You see it all over in the creation. It's also true of God's church. God wants his people to stick together, to strengthen each other, to work together. In fact, if you go into the Bible and you do a, a word search for just that phrase, one another, all kinds of results come up. Jesus told his disciples to love one another. James said, confess your sins to one, or one another. Paul said, serve one another. Bear with one another. Be kind to one another. Teach and admonish one another. And most importantly, forgive one another. Yes, again, you type that phrase into BibleGateway.com search engine and over 190 results come up. Again, over and over, God shows us in his word that he wants us to stick together. He doesn't want us to go it alone. In our creed, for example, we just confessed our faith in the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints. That word suggests a sharing and participation, a working together with uh, your fellow brothers and sisters in the faith. So just me and Jesus, Time one-on-one -on -one with God and prayer and devotion is very good. It's a blessing. But God also wants us to worship together, to serve, to strengthen, to be a blessing to one another. In short, we'll see today that the message flowing through the lesson in Exodus 17, that God wants us to work together in his mighty strength. As last week, we saw how God designed tests along the journey the Israelites were making to the promised land to test their faith. We saw how he tested then provided for them with manna and quail, food and water on their wilderness journey. Today, in his word, we'll see God design something special again. 
in order to teach and to test them, to help them find the joy and satisfaction of doing something together and, and accomplishing God's purposes again as they work together in his mighty strength. But we're in Exodus 17 when the Amalekites were told attacked God's people at Rephidim. Who are the Amalekites? Well, they are the descendants of Amalek, who was a descendant of Esau. You remember Jacob and Esau, the two sons of Isaac? Um, the Israelites were descended from Jacob. Jacob's name was changed to Israel, which means he struggles or contends with the Lord. And it was Jacob who was struggling in prayer in a vision with the Lord one night, and he wouldn't let go until God promised him his blessing and protection from his angry brother Esau. Yes, Jacob had cheated and tricked his brother Esau out of the birthright. And after that, Esau was looking to kill him. So evidently, as we, as we uh, meet up with the Israelites today, there was still some bad blood between those descendants of Esau, the Amalekites, and Israel. So they attacked the Israelites. Moses speaks to Joshua. Joshua, who's mentioned here for the first time, will eventually take over after Moses is gone. Um, he'll be the leader of all God's people here. He's a general in the army of Israel. And Moses tells Joshua, choose some of our men and go out and fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow I will stand upon the top of the hill. And notice, notice what he has in his hands. That staff of God. The staff that God had imbued with supernatural power when he, when he helped Moses and God's people uh, out of slavery in Egypt with the plagues. The staff was used to part the waters of the Red Sea. So as long as Moses was able to keep his arms held high and the staff of God on high, the Israelites were winning the battle. But when his arms grew tired and he let them down, the Amalekites started winning. Yes, Aaron and Hur noticed this and they, they jumped right in to help Moses. We're told they took a stone and put it under him and he sat on it. Aaron and Hur held his hands up, one on one side and one on the other, so that his hands remained steady till sunset. So Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with the sword. Well, now I ask you, why was it that the Israelites won the battle that day? Was it because of Joshua's leadership on the battlefield? Was it perhaps because of the, the, the fierceness and fighting effort of his soldiers under him? Was it Moses? Was it that staff of God that Moses was holding? Was it Aaron and her who were helping out, holding up Moses' arms? Well, I see you shaking your heads. The only reason they won that battle day, you're right, was because of the power and the blessing of God. Yes, God's people wouldn't have been able to accomplish anything that day without God's power and blessing. But at the same time, we might notice how God designs this opportunity and this test of their faith in a way that shows them the benefit, the, the joy, the good feeling, the satisfaction and excitement of doing something together in God's mighty strength. So it was the soldiers and it was Aaron and Hur and Moses that day who pulled together and, and got that good feeling of accomplishing something in the Lord's mighty strength. And it doesn't say here, but you can imagine all of the women and children at home too, their families who were praying for them and cheering them all on, how encouraged all of them must have been as they saw God enable them to have the victory that day. Well, it was the, the staff of God, which was the rallying point for the Israelites that day. Today it is the cross of Christ that is our rallying point. Peter writes about what Jesus, our Savior, did on the cross, how he was our victorious king over 
sin, death, and the devil as he bore our sins in his own body on the tree so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. Yes, it's by his wounds that we have been healed. The cross is our rallying point. That's where we go to be encouraged in our faith, strengthened and equipped to handle all of the tasks and challenges that God puts before us and to fight the good fight of faith, to resist the devil and his temptations. Yes, Peter writes and he says that because Jesus bore our sins, that we die to sins. It means that we, we make a clean break with sin as we remember what Jesus did to take them all away. We live a new life. Empowered by his forgiveness, we seek to live for righteousness, Peter says. Yes, it's by his wounds that we have been healed. So, dear friends, it is in Christ that we join together. We join the ranks, so to speak. We're enlisted to do things together in God's mighty strength. Now, it might not happen in the same dramatic way or be seen in the same way as in our story today, but there's so many times over the years that you've had things designed by God for you, opportunities you've had to pull together in order to, to do things here in God's church. Now, looking back over the last few years, I remember back in 2014, it was my family and children together with Lauren and Nancy Hawk. We did all kinds of work uh, to, to, re, uh, to refurnish and, and to uh, update the, the Bible study and education wing of our church. A joy and satisfaction we felt in pulling together. In 2015, remember our, our organ project. Think of, think of the members, some of you are here, who all had your hands on all of those pipes uh, that we took down from the pipe room to clean the organ and, and to help the technicians as they repaired it. Back in 2016, members pulled together to, to make a heating project happen here. Um, next month, we'll be pulling together to host the pastor's conference. Years ago, way back in, oh, was the, maybe the 70s, we did a... a kind of updated and added on to the front of our building. What a project that was. Think of the times when you've been involved in Sunday school working as a team and brought the Christmas program all together. Think of our carpet project recently. You think of our personal lives too, when God gives us the, the, the joy and satisfaction of pulling together to meet challenges in our lives at home. Maybe it's a, a husband and a wife and the children who pull together when one of the family is suffering with cancer. Everyone pulls together at times, and in God's family, perhaps it's a widow who receives a, a phone call from her pastor or from a sister in the faith with a caring ear, with a, a sympathizing tear. As God's people, God also designs things along our journey of life. They give us opportunities to pull together and to do things in God's mighty strength. Again, it's reaching out too, building up God's church through evangelism. You, you might be sharing a, a passage of comfort or instruction in social media or Facebook. Um, I could go on. But note the important thing here today. It's not just about being busy and doing good things in God's church. There's a lot of people doing good things out in the world, but it's doing things in his mighty strength and to accomplish his saving purposes. Doing things with faith, it means that first we're being equipped by God as we go back to his word. Faith comes from hearing the message. And the message is heard through the word of Christ. We're equipped by God's message of grace and forgiveness and the cross of Christ and we rally together and just say is there something that I can do can I be a part of God's purposes here in the church somehow well before we before we end the lesson today there's one more interesting side to this story 
In Deuteronomy chapter 25, years later, Moses looked back on this fight with the Amalekites and he adds this. Do you remember what the Amalekites did to you along the way when you came out of Egypt? When you were weary and worn out, they met you on your journey and attacked all who were lagging behind. They had no fear of God. You talk about a despicable way to wage war. Here the Amalekites attacked and killed those who were not able to keep up, those who were at the end of the line as the Israelites went through the desert. You think of the elderly or the infirm, uh, perhaps the weak and sick among them, the stragglers. They picked them off and killed them first. It sounds despicable, and it is, but it's also kind of a modus operandi of Satan still today. You see, he studies you, whether you realize it or not. He looks for the, the weak points. He looks to find us where we're susceptible to temptation, and he attacks us those ways. So perhaps if your weakness is pride, maybe he'll set up a scheme to have someone ridicule you. If your weakness is lust, he'll tempt you with sex. If, you're, if your weakness is, is in your marriage, he'll attack you that way. He'll attack your children. He'll attack your past. He'll do whatever he can to find where it is that he can crawl in under the fence and get you where you're weakest. Yes, even though the Israelites weren't looking for that battle against the Amalekites, even though it came to them, and in the same way, Satan will bring the fight to you, trying to steal your mind and your heart away from Christ. So again, how important it is that we find strength and encouragement together to fight the good fight of faith that we strive together and look out for each other and work together in his mighty strength, again, tapping into his word and sacraments, forgiving and teaching and praying for one another, admonishing one another. As in the hymn, it really did underscore earlier how we are like soldiers on a battlefield, like a mighty army, the hymn said, moves the church of God. Brothers, we are treading where the saints have trod. In other words, it's been the same way for believers, saints who've gone before us. Yes, we are not divided, all one body, we. One in hope and doctrine, one in charity. Onward, Christian soldiers marching as to war, with the cross of Jesus going on before. That's our rallying point. The Israelites had the staff of God. We have the cross of Christ. After the battle that day, we're told that Moses built an altar and called it, The Lord is my banner. He wanted everyone to know and remember why it was that they fought and won that day. The battle was the Lord's. And it's true still today. Whenever we're battle-weary and warm, whenever our challenges or trials seem too great, remember that the battle is the Lord's. He involves us all in this struggle. He designs our struggles and tests and temptations even in ways that involve us so that we grow and learn and feel the satisfaction of joy of sticking together. But remember always, the Lord is our banner. The Lord is is with us. The battle has already been won against sin, death, and the devil. Heaven is our home. Jesus promises to help us fight that good fight of faith until we reach that glorious destination above. God grant this for Jesus' sake. Amen.